We are in 1 Peter chapter 4. If you have your Bible in any form, online, physical, whatever, we would ask that you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to talk about suffering again. We have been talking about suffering for a while because we chose uh, to work on having hope. And we want to have you have more hope in your life, even in the midst of times of suffering. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, we're going to cover verses 1 through 11 this morning. This is a really important passage. If you're suffering on any level, this message is for you today, and I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. So it's really important. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So we continue our talk on suffering, and Peter and the rest of the New Testament is going to say this. All human beings suffer. We all do. Christians even suffer. Sometimes we suffer because we did not make a very wise decision, and we have to suffer the consequences of that decision. Sometimes that's our suffering. But sometimes we suffer, and we're innocent. We didn't do anything wrong. We didn't hurt anybody. It's the choice of another person comes into our life, and now we're suffering. So, in the middle of that suffering, it can be confusing as to what you should do. And Peter's going to tell you exactly what to do this morning. We can get down, we can get discouraged, we can get depressed, it can be hard. And we start suffering, and our head starts spinning, and we sometimes then begin to do the exact wrong thing for the moment. So in chapter 3, verse 18, going back, we already discussed the sufferings of Christ. So when we talk about the sufferings of Christ, he's the perfect example and the only example of a man, the God-man, who suffered and yet did nothing wrong. Okay? None of us can say that. We can say it in a particular situation, but we can't say it as a life goal. We've all done things to hurt others. Some of our suffering is on us. Jesus is the only one who suffered even though he was totally righteous. So, Peter tells you and I this. He says in verse 1, Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So what does that mean? Because he just told you what to do when you're suffering. He said if you're suffering... Arm yourself with the same way of thinking. The word translated arm yourself right there is the only time in the Greek New Testament that that word is used. One time. It means to arm yourself in the same way that a soldier in that time would have armed himself. To take the same care and to take the same determination that a soldier would put armor on and prepare himself and arm himself for battle... You're going to arm yourself in this one way when, you're, when you suffer. And what is that? So let's go back and think about when Christ suffered. He suffered a number of times in his ministry, we know that. But there was one in particular time where his suffering kind of, kind of represented all of the suffering that he would do. And that was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he is crucified. And the disciples are supposed to be praying and watching and being careful and being his friends, essentially. And Jesus goes to pray and he prays a prayer that says, I don't want this. I do not want the suffering that I'm about to go through. Jesus was not blind to what was going to happen. And he says but not my will, but yours be done. 
So in 1 Peter 4, he says, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. And then look at the end of verse 2. He says, for the will of God. The short answer for when you are suffering is that you do the will of God. That's the short, concise, easy answer. You will do the will of God. When you're suffering for your own bad decisions, it's okay to go, I made a bad decision and I was wrong. Now my next steps will be the will of God. Great. Or I'm in the middle of suffering from someone else's choices, but I don't have power over them, so I will still do the will of God in my life. Just in the same way that Jesus did the will of God, even though he was suffering at the hands of somebody else, he didn't deserve it, he does the will of God. So, I used to think I was a youth pastor for like seven, seven years, and then I was out of ministry for about a year, year and a half, two years, and then I've been at Mountainside now for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years. And I used to think, when I was an early pastor, that the will of God, like we all wanted to do the will of God, we just needed to know what the will of God was, and we wanted to do it. I don't think that's true. I look at myself in my age now, and I look at my sin, my selfishness, my self-centeredness, and I'm like, I actually don't want to do the will of God a whole bunch of times. I actually want to do my own will. And then I thought, if I just teach the Bible clear enough, and meet with people and have clear communication about what the will of God is for them, then they'll go, oh, I understand it now. It was an understanding problem. And now that I understand the Bible, thanks to your incredible teaching, now I'm able to do the will of God. Thank you. And you find out, mm -mm, that's not true either. We don't do the will of God because we are hard hearted sinners hard hearted God himself could come down and tell you his will and me personally I'd be like eh are you sure you know all the surrounding situation that I'm going through are you sure you know my life dreams and goals have you taken those into account God when you told me your will did you consider my personality did you consider who, who you made me? Did you consider that that's hard? And God says, yeah, I considered all that. And you know what you find out as you get older and older and older? Is that nobody gets a special exemption from this. I don't have one and you don't have one. Now listen, we all get special exemptions. Um... I can't draw. I can't draw. I've sat down and tried to, I remember being a kid, like you see a kid draw in class and you're like, you start drawing and it looks like, like you're a baby just grabbing a crayon, like Neanderthal, like, and I'm like, oh, I can't draw. And then you try and try and try and realize it's just not, you just get a pass for that. Some learned behaviors, you get a pass on. If you're not musically inclined, you're not musically inclined. God didn't make you that way. But when it comes to God's will, nobody gets a free pass. Not one of us can say, I am so bad of a drawer that I can't love my neighbor as I love myself. I can't do that. So I must get a free pass on that, God. That verse doesn't apply to me. So I used to understand, I used to think that that was how we got doing God's will. And then I thought, nope, that's not true. It's just, it's just hard. It's like an eternal, it's like a, it's like a, you're a living sacrifice where you're constantly sacrificing yourself for the will of God. Now, when it comes to the will of God, there's two different pieces. One, the known will of God. Those are easy verses. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the will of God for you. 
So if anybody here is not loving another person in the same way that Christ loved them, then you're not doing the will of God. Forgive one another so that I can forgive you. That's the will of God. It's the will of God for you to forgive somebody. Do not repay evil for evil, but give a blessing instead. That was in a sermon not three weeks ago. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's all the will of God. So you don't get a special exemption for that. But there are times in our lives when the will of God is not as clear. In other words, I don't have a verse when you're all mixed up and you're like, you're at, you're, you're at the car dealership and you're like, Mercedes BMW, Father, I, I don't know. I just don't know your will right now. I have found in those situations that we need to rely on the closest scripture that we have to the situation. We need to seek godly counsel. We need to apply the biblical overarching theme of love. And we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So even when you don't have a direct verse on thou shalt not buy a Mercedes, I'm joking. It'll break down on you and it'll be expensive, but go ahead. <laughs> if I don't have a direct verse, then I rely on what's a close verse. What's the Holy Spirit leading me to do? What does godly people around me tell me what to do? And what, what would the overarching theme of love, what would God want me to do if I love my neighbor as I, what would he want me to do? Maybe. Or a Toyota is what I found out. <clears throat> so let me say it this way. Here's my fear. We often don't follow the will of God in small things, so we get totally overwhelmed in the big things. Let me say it another way. We often don't follow God's will in the known things, and so we get totally overwhelmed in the unknown things. We often, in our sin, we skip over the known. Love the Lord your God. Forgive those. Don't repay evil for evil. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know all that. Don't do any of it. And then get totally overwhelmed in your life when you're suffering. Or when you need to know God's will. Okay. So the only question I have is, will you and I do the will of God? I've noticed over and over and over, we all have plans. You and I have plans for retirement, for friendship, for marriage, for parenting, for uh, our bodies, our homes, all kinds of things. We have plans. We do. We make plans. When's the last time you just made a plan and just fully submitted it to the will of God? Like, God, is this your will? Man, I have a plan, and I want to pursue that plan. But did I even stop to say, is that God's plan? Well, number one, what does this say over the plan? And then number two, if I don't have an actual verse, how do I submit to the Holy Spirit through godly counsel, blah, blah, blah. Here's what I see, guys. I see a bunch of people at times that I meet, nobody here, probably people listening online, but nobody here. What I see is some of us have bad plans, guys. We have a plan and we're executing it and it's a bad plan because it doesn't even hold up to what you know in God's word, let alone like, okay, it's not in God's word now. How do I, how do I prayerfully and lovingly walk through this? Please understand me. You all make plans. Submit your plans to God and see what he says to you. He might say, that's a bad plan. He might. He might. Verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Wow. 
two quick things. Number one, Christians should be different. At some level, guys, you're, you, as a Christian, you should be different at some level. I'm not going to go into what that looks like. There is, you know the Bible, you know key verses, but I'm not going to sit up here, here and say, which was said 50 years ago, Christians don't, and then we pick things that are easy to find on the exterior. Dance, play electric guitars on stage. That's why we don't ever plug in a guitar anywhere here. We also don't have electricity, but that's besides the point. We, we pick things that were like easy to judge. Christians' lives should be different, and primarily they should be different because of our love. Number one. But number two, every person needs to give an account to God. And let me say this very clearly. They do not give, need to give an account to you. They, they, they don't. Someone may have hurt you. Someone may have sinned against you. Someone may have mocked you. Someone may have done something against you, but they don't ultimately answer to you. They answer to God. And God will judge righteously at the end of the day. So I'm going to ask each of you to do one thing for me, and then we'll finish this out. One thing for me today. You need to let somebody else go who has hurt you, done something to you. Just let them go to God so that you can be free. Let me say that again. You need to let somebody go and just say, God, that, that's between you and them so that you can be free. See, you think you're letting them free because you're letting them go and they got to escape. Escape to who? God Almighty, the judge of the entire universe? Yeah, that's good hands. That's safe to let somebody go, okay, God, you literally know everything. I'm a peon. I know nothing. I'm going to let you into, into your, I'm going to let them into your hands. And I'm going to release them so that I can be free. Because I'm not the judge of the living and the dead. I'm not that person. It's very, very freeing. You've got to do that. And then verse 6 tells us briefly here, For this is why the gospel was preached, even though, to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Peter says this, The end of all things is at hand. Period. We're not debating anymore when Jesus is coming back. <clears throat> we don't know. The fact of the matter is, he is coming back. It's as good as a done deal. He's coming back. So Peter says, because he's coming back, therefore, five things. Be self-controlled. Be sober-minded. All for the sake of your prayers. Keep loving one another earnestly, since love, or, love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And as has each received a gift, use it to serve one another. <clears throat> All those five things are the will of God for you today. That's the will of God. Be self-controlled. If you haven't noticed, life under COVID... <clears throat> I've been fully vaccinated, I'm okay. Um... Life under COVID and life coming out of COVID, people are looking to fight. I don't know if you noticed this. People are looking to fight at Walmart. People are looking to fight on social media. People in your family are looking to fight. Everyone's looking for a real good fight right now. Christians are self-controlled. That doesn't say Christians have no opinion. That's not what that says. It doesn't say Christians should always be quiet. It doesn't say that either. Just walk away and go eat some Doritos. You'll feel much better. You'll feel way better than arguing with people on social media and typing your little heart away and then having people smash you. Because that's what happens. 
Christians are self-controlled. You're going to say, your sin cost me damages of, I mean, you can't even have your car touched for two grand anymore. So, you t- your, your, my car co- is five grand to fix. And they say, oh, I'm sorry about that. I really am. That was, that was my bad. But I want my $5,000. Oh, well, I just don't have that. Sorry, have a good day. Would you be left a little angry? Bitter, upset, wanting blood, eye for eye, tooth for tooth? I would. So what does that mean? Love covers a multitude of sins. Here's what it means. Every time people sin against you, it costs a payment. A payment has to be made. When we sinned against God, who made the payment for us? Jesus Christ. So when someone sins against you, the Bible's not saying you have to. You don't have to do anything. You can be miserable and rot in your bitterness for the next 50 years. You can. But when the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins, here's what it means. This person sinned against me. A payment is owed. I make the payment and I do it in love. Therefore, the payment's good. Love covers over a multitude of sins and now I get to walk away and be free. That's incredible. Nobody does it though. We say it. We're Christians. Jesus loves us. He loves us so much that he died for us. But that person, come hell or high water, I'm going to strangle every last cent out of that person. And I will not forgive them, and I will hold it over their head until the day I die. And then when they die, I will go sit on their grave, if you know what I mean. And Jesus says, or you could show love. And what love will do is it will cover cover that sin. And now you can walk away and you can be a free man or a free woman. Why would I not sign up for that, people? Love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable without grumbling. Grumbling is what we do. It's all we do now. We grumble, we grumble, we grumble. When it gets really bad, we grumble on Facebook. Don't grumble on social media. I'm going to talk really straight now. Please understand me. When you grumble on social media, what do you what are you crying out for? Love, attention, someone to hear. Am I right? That's why we, okay? You're not going to get that on social media. Here's what you're going to get on social media. When you grumble, people are going to look at it and go. So you're actually going to get the opposite of what you need. So can I tell you when you're grumbling, when you're complaining, do you know what you need to do? Will you go find a friend, a real person who loves you, who just loves you, who will listen to you, who will care for you, who will just go, grumble to me. I love you. You need, a, you need a person to talk to. But social media, most of the time, we drive people away from us rather than endear people to us. And it's in that moment where we just need help. We just, we just need somebody. That's one of the reasons you're part of a church. We're not supposed to live the Christian life alone. Like We're not wolves out in the the mountains. Even wolves have each other. We We don't live alone. We can't do that. We are not made to do that, people. And finally, we need to be about serving one another. The one another's there are the one another's of Scripture, which means those are things we do for Christians. Not saying we don't do this for people who need Jesus, but in this particular passage, it's use your spiritual gift, use your natural abilities, use your wealth to help other Christians. 
that's what you're called to do. It's the will of God. So today, I'm, I'm giving you five things that are the will of God. The known will of God. Can I ask everybody to start doing these five things? Start walking in the will of God. And then see if some other things start coming into more clarity. Number one. And number two. Somebody in this open air pavilion is suffering right now. Somebody's suffering. Somebody suffering because you make a very you made a very bad choice. And you need to repent of your sin and you need to do the will of God. And someone here is suffering and it wasn't your fault. And you need to do what? The will of God. The answer to both people is do the will of God. But stop giving lip service to this and God's will and say, "Yep, I don't know what's wrong with my life." Um, everybody's against me, everybody fights me, my whole life is miserable. You know what, in that moment, I know you want to give up, but you can't give up. Because what all those people did to you, it matters zero. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. You are still you. You still are breathing and living today. You are still God's child, and you're still called to do His will, whether or not Anybody around you is performing to the level of expectation that you have for them or you need from them. It just doesn't matter. You are still you. And you can do this. You can do the will of God. Dave, as Dave comes forward, we're going to... Do you want to sing? Can we sing one? Or should I just pray now? We'll do one. Cool. All right. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for each and every person here this morning. We love you, and we ask that you would help us do your will, even in the midst of suffering. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.